coming up on ATV FastCast. And may it come across the road and right in front of me, and I was like, <gasps> USU warned you about a mountain lion near campus. We'll show you how it ended. It's limited edition design, so we only make it for this specific event. We'll show you what USU students donated their sweaters for. It's very drawn to earth. We'll show you the mugs you won't see at the coffee shop and tell you where you can buy them. Love is in the air today, but will snow be tomorrow? In weather, I'll show you if this snowman could get a valentine. In sports, I'll show you which former head basketball coach received honors from the university and if the team resumed their winning ways. All that and more, this is ATV FastCast. From the campus of Utah State University in Logan, Utah, the Department of Journalism and Communication presents the award-winning newscast, ATV News. If I see it, then I'll be scared. The possibility of a mountain lion roaming around USU Tuesday morning didn't have these runners scared, but the sightings were not just on campus. Welcome to ATV News. I'm Katie White. And I'm JT Miller. USU sent an Aggie alert to students and faculty Tuesday morning warning of a mountain lion near Aggie Village. Nearly an hour later, a homeowner who lives east of campus called 911 to report he had a mountain lion in his yard. I looked on the deck and the cat was sitting right there. Kind of startled me pretty bad. Crookston <laughs> it says it spent about 15 minutes in his yard before cops showed up and the mountain lion jumped the fence. Wildlife officers brought a tranquilizer gun, but the mountain lion took off again. I was sitting on a work meeting and my wife comes freaking out saying, hey, there are a bunch of cops and DNR agents in our front yard. I heard Wildlife saying. officers darted the mountain lion around 10 a.m. Residents stopped to pose with a downed cat. Biologists will complete a health assessment and will likely release it after determining its condition. Wildlife Resources says the mountain lion likely came down this far because it was looking for food and there are some deer in the cemetery. A construction worker fell 30 feet down scaffolding Monday. At a construction site near 670 East, 1650 North, Logan Fire said the worker landed on his feet in the mud. The worker broke both of his legs. Bystanders put two tourniquets on the worker's legs to, pre to prevent him from bleeding out. One first responder says this could have been much worse. Possible serious injuries from that height. The construction worker missed nearby concrete when he landed in the mud. Logan Fire say they were able to carry on conversation with the patient on the scene. At the TSC, you're able to donate your old clothing for a brand new sweater. Students get a chance to repurpose clothing that they donate at the TSC for a limited edition sweater. Old sweaters and we buy them a new one. It's limited edition design, so we only make it for the specific event. And we change it up every year so that it looks different from the, le like the last. Makes it a bit more special for students to come and gives them incentive to donate. The sweaters that students donate will be going toward the DI or to an organization that is in need of sweaters. USU Ceramics Guild says it's tradition for members to promote the art of ceramics through events and sales. And they did that this week. Ceramics Guild members sold mugs they handcrafted at the Guild's Valentine's Day sale on Monday. People stopped to look at the variety of mugs made by artists using different techniques. One member says she used her hands to make her mugs, not a potter's will. They're all hand built. Some of them have like little hearts and stuff. I wanted it to be a little bit kitschy for Valentine's Day. Baker says money from the sale helps members go to a national ceramics conference the Guild has four sales a year. Baker says a Mother's Day sale is coming up at the end of the semester. The Aggie Block A is nice and cozy in some Valentine's themed crochet squares today. The current temperature is 40 degrees. And after weather. And in sports, Ryan Lawrenson joins us in the studio to show us how the hockey team did in their conference tournament.
Listen, you're my friend. I noticed you haven't really been yourself recently. Yeah, I feel like something's up. How are you? Are you okay? Is there anything you want to talk about? I just want to know how you're feeling. And listen, even if you don't know what to say, I'm here to talk. No matter what you're going through, I just want you to know I'm here. I've got your back. When you want to talk, I'm here. This is Dave. This is Bob. Dave took multimedia boot camp. Bob did not. We need company headshots. I've worked on headshots before and I would be happy to do it again. We also need to finish our company advertisement video. I already have a shot list and it's ready for you to approve. Bob, would you be willing to work on our company podcast? Um, I, I would be happy to take care of that. You're so prepared. You deserve a promotion. Be like Dave and take multimedia boot camp at Utah State. Get experience in a little bit of everything. Welcome to ATV Weather, I'm Joe Cooney. Starting with our national radar, we can see a system of precipitation, mainly rain, over the west coast of the US. Now we also see another system of rain and some snow over the northern Great Plains. However, this system over the west coast will be of more importance to us over the next week because it is going to progress eastward and come towards Utah, hopefully giving us some precipitation. Zooming in on Utah, we can see that already starting to happen a little bit with this system of precipitation over Nevada, which will also continue to progress eastward. Now, we also see some cloud cover over northern Utah, which was a bit sparse this morning, but tended to intensify as the morning went on. Now, again, over tonight and then tomorrow, we can see that this system in Nevada is progressing eastward and hopefully it will continue to do so, which could amount to some precipitation in Utah, snow in the mountains and maybe some rain in the valleys which we'll see in our seven day forecast. But now let's look at some camera footage from Alta Ski Resort that was taken last night over a 12 hour period. Now we can see that Alta Resort got about five inches of snow last night, but over the next three days, we're looking to see a good bit more than that uh, in some certain ski areas in Utah. For example, Park City Ski Resort, we're expecting to see about seven inches of snow as we can see on this lovely snow depth gauge here and then in Alta ski area where this footage was taken over the next three days cumulatively not all at once but cumulatively we're expecting to see about 11 inches and then up here in Logan Canyon for Beaver Mountain and Cherry Peak we're expecting to see about 14 to 15 inches of snow over the next three days but what does that look like in Logan well tonight we have about a 30 percent chance of rain and snow uh, and then going into tomorrow we have a very high chance of rain and snow, especially snow during the day, which is something to watch out for. High temperatures are gonna be around 40 and dipping down a little bit when we come into the weekend, but coming up a bit next week. Low temperatures are gonna be around 32 degrees, hence the snow that we might see during the night. Now those high temperatures during the day in the 40s can more so correspond to rain than snow. We are looking at a lot of precipitation this week and going into next week, but on Saturday, we're expecting to see a mostly sunny day with a high near 41. That might be a great day to take advantage of all that snow we could be seeing in the ski resorts. Now that you're all caught up in weather on this lovely Valentine's Day, let's go back to the desk. Thanks, Joe. USU continued its celebration of Black History Month Friday with a presentation on natural African-American hairstyles and why you should care about it. The science of what's inside a relaxer. Photojournalist St. Clair Dietrich Jules spent four years photographing and interviewing black women with natural hair. She says even if it's hard feeling different, people with natural black hair should love it. Hair in the black community has a history, you know, ancestrally of being connected to our identity. Dietrich Jewell says even though the black community may be smaller here in Utah, members of that community shouldn't feel alone and should have a stronger sense of love in recognizing the beauty of natural black hair. Thank you. USU's Black Student Union coordinated the event. 
For more Black History Month events here at Utah State, check out our Facebook page. Those aren't boos you're hearing, it's the Aggie Faithful showing their love for longtime head basketball coach Stu Morrill as USU honored him by naming the court at the, the court at the Spectrum in his honor. Welcome to ATV Sports, I'm Ryan Lawrenson. Let's first take a trip back in time to Saturday's game against Boise State on the freshly minted Stu Morrill Court. If you thought last Tuesday's match against Nevada had the Spectrum rocking, then it should be no surprise that on Coach Morrill's Night of Nights, the Spectrum sold out. Getting things started in the first half, check out this nice dish by Darius Brown to Mason Falslev. And that was one of his three three-pointers. Now down at the other end, nice pass here by Boise State's Tyson Dagenhart to Max Rice, good for one of his four three-pointers. Utah State and the freshman Falslev could not be stopped though as he makes a strong drive through Rice on his way to the basket. And another one, this time at the hands of Ian Martinez. He fakes the drive, steps back, shoots, and drains another three-pointer for the Aggies. But that was his only three-point make of the night. Check out the moves here on Falslev to clean up an Aggie defensive rebound, then drive through four Bronco defenders, taking it all the way downtown for another two points. The Aggies dominated the first half and headed to the locker room with an 11-point lead. On to the second half. Nice pass here by Khalifa Sako to Falslev on his way back to the rim. Nice finish there as the freshman had himself a 25-point night. Now down in front of the herd, Max Rice tries to get that to Dagenhart, but great steal here by Great Osabor, who sends it all the way down to Brown for an easy layup. The Aggies started scoring early and never looked back on this one, taking the much-needed win over the Broncos 61-80. That win puts the Aggies back in firm control of the top seed in the Mountain West. The Aggies are in Laramie tonight to take on the Wyoming Cowboys. This starts their final stretch of seven games before the Mountain West Tournament kicks off in Las Vegas on Wednesday, March 13th. The hockey team competed for the Mountain West Collegiate Hockey League Championship over the weekend, pulling off not one, but two upsets. The Aggies started the weekend as the fourth seed in the Mountain West Collegiate Hockey League Tournament, and some of the region's best teams were in attendance. Round one had the Aggies facing off against the Montana Grizzlies, seeing four different Aggies score. Sam Voss led the way for Utah State with two goals, including one of three unassisted goals scored by the Aggies. Team leading scorer Jackson Ferry also added to his season tally with a goal of his own. Friday's game was supposed to be a dream crusher as the Aggies faced off against number one seeded Montana State Bobcats, who also owned the top seed in the West region. This game was a scoring fest for some of the team's freshmen. Winger Jackson Ferry scored himself a hat trick. Center Ben Sheeta had a couple of assists and a goal of his own. And defenseman Tate Jensen scored his first goal as an Aggie in this game. Final score here was 5-2 for the Aggies. And finally, on Saturday, the Aggies continued the dream run against the University of Providence Argos. Starting in the second period, the Aggies are down 1-0 when senior defenseman Trace Farr takes a shot here. And it bounces off of the stick of freshman forward Caleb Sanborn to tie things up at one. Good for his 11th goal of the season. Moving into the third period, Sean Johnston adding to his season tally with this nice rebound pass from captain Ben Carlson for his 11th goal of the year. And get used to hearing Jackson Ferry's name, Aggie fans. He's going to be a star for Aggie hockey. Watch as he takes this pass from Zach Pierce to put the Aggies up 3-1. to one. Good for his fifth goal of the weekend and the 29th goal of his season. A late goal by Argos captain Jacob Stevenson wasn't quite enough, though, as the Aggies become NWCHL champions for the first time since 2018. The ACHA's final regular season rankings came out last night, and despite the wins, the Aggies stayed in the sixth seed for the West Region. Ahead of the regional tournament hosted at the Eccles, Utah State will have their senior night this Friday with puck drop scheduled for 7 p.m. in North Logan. Women's basketball came close to a win on Saturday against Air Force, but Falcon sophomore guard Milani Perry's 24 points proved to be too much for the Aggies, losing 78-72. Gymnastics was in Oklahoma Friday for a four-team meet with Oklahoma, BYU, and Texas Women's University, with the Sooners coming out on top with a score of 198.45. The Aggies placed third with a score of 195 even. Softball had their opening day over the weekend, defeating Portland State 6-2 on Saturday after the game was originally postponed Friday. They also lost to ninth-ranked Oklahoma State 10-1. 
Taylor Swift's boyfriend's team, the Kansas City Chiefs, took on the San Francisco 49ers in Super Bowl 58 on Sunday, and they weren't playing for any paper rings. That's right, the Swifty Bell is back for these Super Bowl highlights. Are you ready for it? We take a look here first as sparks fly for the Niners kicker Jake Moody as he goes ahead and drains his first field goal of the game, good for 55 yards uh, to start the gold rush. Now we're taking another look here at Brock Purdy and making a nice pass. No, make that Jawan Jennings to Christian McCaffrey, good for uh, the, their first touchdown of the game and a 21-yard pass. That was just one of his eight receptions, good for 80 yards in the air, and an additional 80 yards on the ground across 22 carries. The Chiefs went on to shake it off for their next possession, driving the ball 65 yards until it finally came into the hands of kicker Harrison Butker to put his team on the board just before halftime, down seven. It was all red in the third quarter as Harrison Butker makes this field goal with just over five minutes remaining, and it deserves another look because at 57 yards, that is is the longest field goal made in Super Bowl history. Then, after punting away on the Chiefs' next possession, the cleat of 49er quarterback Darrell Luter touches the ball first, causing returner Ray Ray McLeod to have to scramble for it. He misses the ball, and it's recovered by the Chiefs here, right there at the 16-yard line. QB Patrick Mahomes said, it's time to go, sending the ball 16 yards straight down to Marquez, Val Marquez Valdez-Scantling, sitting in a blank space in the end zone, and the Chiefs finally have a lead of their own. But we aren't out of the woods yet, as Jennings makes another appearance on the score sheet, taking this 10-yard pass all the way home to put the Niners back on top. Jennings had four catches and 42 yards on the night. The Chiefs read the point after attempt all too well though, and Leo Chennault makes a nice block on Moody here and the PAT crew. It was back and forth for the rest of regulation with field goals made by each team. And some fans were saying, is it over now? This is me trying to tell you that this game went to overtime. This Super Bowl went out in style as the 49ers had the ball first. And the clock management was unreal in OT. Both teams had to begin again and see who could come out on top with the NFL's new rules for bonus football. After 7 minutes and 38 seconds of possession time, the Niners are only able to put up three points from Jake Moody's final field goal attempt of the night, this one from just 27 yards. Can San Francisco's defense tolerate it? Let's find out. It was a lot of the same for the KC offense with Super Bowl MVP Pat Mahomes coming up clutch on this fourth and short here coming up soon, extending the Chiefs' hopes for the Lombardi Trophy. He takes the snap, fakes the handoff, then runs it himself all the way to the 42-yard line. Finally, after their own seven-minute drive, can the Chiefs achieve their wildest dreams of back-to-back -back Super Bowl victories? Well, see for yourself. Mahomes easily reads the route, but ran by wide receiver Mecole Hardman. So long story short, the Chiefs win Super Bowl 58 with a final score of 25 to 22. This game was the last time we will get to see NFL football until August, and even though fans may think it's going to be a forever winter and a cruel summer, this Super Bowl was certainly one for the books. Now that you're all caught back up on sports, I'll hand it back over to you at the desk. Thanks, Ryan. And thank you for joining us on this edition of ATV FastCast. You can find this and other editions on our Facebook page. We'll leave you with shots of the princess party put on by the family place over the weekend. Have a great week, Cash Valley. A redhead <gasps> staring contest. You still got it. I know. Come alive with the forest. The dad was cute. You were looking right at us. Visit discovertheforest.org to find.